politics, business, and religion. We discuss the topics you avoid at the dinner table, bringing you the biggest names in Texas politics and beyond. This is The Trey Blocker Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Trey Blocker Show. We are honored to have in the studio today Texas State Representative Ben Lamont. Representative, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Trey. I appreciate the invitation. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. Tell our audience, we've got listeners all over the state of Texas and, and, and beyond, interestingly, even some folks in Australia who listen to this show. Why, I don't know, but they do. It's so, Texas. It's that's Texas. right. Everybody, well, the Australians are as fascinated with Texas as we are fascinated with Australia, right? right? right. So tell everyone where you're from and what your district is like. Okay, well, I live in Grimes County, Texas. You know, that is situated between College Station and Huntsville, north of Houston, about an hour and a half. It's a very rural area. I live out on a, on a ranch. We have cattle, we have horses, dogs, chickens, pigs, the whole nine yards. Nice. Our kids are very active in 4-H. And, and so my district kind of wraps around College Station like a U-shaped, okay. and then it goes south and west from there. It covers seven counties, all very similar in nature, a uh, rural district. Gotcha. So, did you, were you born and raised out there? No, I was born in Magnolia, Texas, which is uh, north of Houston again, but closer to Houston. It was rural when I was raised there. We had a small farm. You know, Houston encroached upon us, and I moveth out. <laughs> I don't blame you. I've yeah. done the same thing. Right. So, tell me about your family. How many kids right. you got? I am blessed to be married to my wife, Christy, for going on 15 years ah, this year. Congratulations. So, we're right around the corner from that 15-year mark. and. Uh, just she's the absolute foundation of my life she's very supportive and and you know this this life journey we've been on so far has been great we mm -hmm. have four children uh, three boys and a girl the oldest is 13 and our, our baby is a girl and she's five years old and she's well protected uh, it sounds like it yeah. it sounds like it give me names real quick uh, James Luke Benny and Evelyn okay so I was scrolling through my Instagram feed last night and saw something that you posted. Apparently had James on the House floor yesterday. <laughs> and uh, the speaker, uh, Representative Craig Goldman, was in the speaker's right. seat, and they let him bang the gavel, right? Yes. And it, I'm surprised the head of that gavel didn't fly off. I mean, he hit it pretty hard. <laughs> you know, it was funny. The first time he did it, I said, James, be careful. Don't, don't overdo it. And he, uh -huh. and he did it. And, and he wasn't pleased with it with the turnout of the first time. And so, I tell you what, let me stop you right there. Let's turn up here, and I'm actually going to play the video. Let's oh, watch, yeah, let's okay. watch the video of him doing that. <laughs> Okay, so that was pretty funny. What, uh, he, so he wasn't happy the first time he, he banged it, so he wanted to get a little more A little more behind muscle it. behind it, and I okay. said, look, James, pretend like you're at the Renaissance Festival, and you're, you, you have to ring that bell. That's what I told him. <laughs> ring that bell, son. So this is your fault. No, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> and so he said he got that message, and, uh, and he tried to ring the bell. And uh, if you noticed on the video, uh, Representative Goldman, his reaction it, yes. it caught him off guard, and later he told me that was actually the by far the hard, the hardest hit <laughs> gavel that he's had ever, that, <laughs> you know, that he's heard seen ever. Right, so. right. So. And so you have that on video, so James can show that to all all his buddies and, and brag about how hard he <laughs> banged the gavel. <laughs> right, that's awesome. So, what do your kids think? You're a freshman state legislator. You're coming to Austin all the time to do this. What are their thoughts on it? What did they they think when you decided to run for the seat? You know, this has been a, a, a obviously a family adjustment, uh, but we, uh, prior to running for this office, had already made the decision to make some significant family adjustments on, on how we manage our time as a family. And we, our kids were in public school system. My wife was on the school board and, and she was a former teacher, but we decided to homeschool. So that has offered tremendous flexibility. So my wife and, and kids come up here with me. Oh, that's great. Every week. That and, is great. Uh, so they'll come up on a Monday and go back later in the week and, and if, if sometimes they have to go a little bit earlier than I do but it's been very uh, helpful to maintaining that family focus and maintaining that family unit and, and, uh, and closeness you know and that, so it's right. been wonderful. Absolutely. So what did your wife say when you decided to run for office? You know this this isn't my first office to run for. Previously I was a county judge in Grimes right. County right. and uh, so we have cut our teeth on being elected official family uh, in, on that and 
So this this is obviously a much larger leap to as far as effect on the family unit. Sure. And uh, she was initially cautious, as we uh, all were, including mm -hmm. myself, and understanding the impact that it could have to the family uh, dynamics and making sure that it was a good fit. We didn't have much time to consider. You know, we had right. three days there from the announcement uh, from my predecessor that he was not going to run uh, prior to the that filing deadline. Representative Leighton Schubert, right, who right. kind of at the last minute decided, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this anymore. I need to focus on other things. Right, and so we had to decide it pretty quick and think through this pretty quick whether or not we could, we could do it or not. So here's what I'm really concerned about: who takes care of the pigs when you're going? You know, luckily this year, uh, it was a very conscious uh, effort to discuss this topic. We have shown pigs every year since our kids have, have been eligible to show. Right. And this year, we have decided we're pulling the plug on the pigs. No and we're showing 20 heifers now. We're, we okay. Have, okay. We have uh, six pens of three that we are showing this year in the county fair. And so that offers a lot more flexibility uh, and, and not a, as much, not, as, not so demanding on a daily basis. So. Sure. We just had to shift gears a little bit. Gotcha. So you grew up on a farm and a ranch and, and decided to continue in that vein. Why? You know, I believe that at the heart of every Texan, rural Texas values exist. Everybody has some tie to rural Texas mm -hmm. in, their, in their life, whether right. it's in their current family, uh, friends, or family history. Somewhere along the way, it's the lure of, of rural Texas that grabs people uh, by the heart and chokes them up. And it's what they identify the Texas culture to be, Sure. whether you're in urban Texas or, or, or rural Texas. And so I think rural Texas in particular has its value system that people are attracted to. And, and it carries over into urban Texas. Right. You know? So, uh, uh, yeah, I think, you know, that rural Texas values are, are, are very relevant. Gotcha. So, but that's not your full-time job, is it? What? I'm sorry. Farming and ranching? No, it is not. No, it is not. So, my background, uh, I started a business when I was in college. Uh, so, that was 1997. You're going over 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, started in my mom's garage with just $2,500 and, and, a, and a partner. And nice. we grew it to over 100 employees, 25 stocking locations around the world. We were in a manufacturer of oil and gas equipment. I did right. that for 16 years. I traveled all over the world and, and, and country for that business, and we were very successful. I ended up selling it to a public company and uh, moved on. I was recruited into running for county judge. Decided I had my background was very relevant for that, planning mm. for rapid growth, managing rapid growth. Is right, because you're how far from Houston? Not too far. Uh, I live probably an hour, hour and a half, hour right. and 45 minutes from right. Houston. But, you know, we are not far from the urban or suburban crawl that, that's knocking on our door right mm -hmm. now. So as new construction of highways happen through our district, uh, that brings growth. And so with that comes growth concerns. And right. having the, the skill set to manage rapid growth was something that our county needed and I felt I possessed, and the voters agreed. They voted me in on a three-way race and, and uh, became Grimes County Judge. So I did that immediately prior to this. But aside from that, investment, business uh, right. investment. So was that the biggest issue for you as County Judge, was dealing with transportation issues? Certainly one of the, the big ones, but no, I, I would say the biggest issue at the heart of it was economic development. Okay. You know, so rural Texas is at a tremendous disadvantage when it comes to economic uh, development. And, and there are many spokes that come off of that wheel of economic development. One is transportation, like, mm -hmm. like we just mentioned, uh, highway construction. You know, there was a road, Highway 249, that was proposed to be constructed through Grimes County to connect College Station to, to Houston effectively. Right. And uh, it was proposed as a toll road. And I was adamantly opposed to that. Mm. And the reason I was opposed to the toll road was because it limited access to that infrastructure. I knew Houston's growing, uh, you know, it's coming out, College Station is growing, right. you know, they need to open up avenues of transportation to efficiently move people. I, I was not trying to stop the, the, the project in any way, shape, or form. I was trying to make sure it benefited our citizens, mm -hmm. you know, sure. and, and by having a non-access toll road, 
rural Texas can't locate <coughs> business parks or business businesses off of that infrastructure that we could never afford to build. You so know, you're not going to get the economic growth out of it, right. and you and then it's probably splitting up people's properties, and you have that issue as well, right? Right. Well, certainly private property rights is one of those spokes, but uh, it ended up they ended up getting away from the toll. Okay. And allowed access, so it's a non-toll road now uh, right. with with access to that infrastructure. So that is now going to benefit our community. And having that mechanism to communicate the impact and of that to the state, this all stakeholders, and especially the state that's overseeing the project, is critical. And the state did a great job listening and understanding that you know it's not always about point A to point B. Mm -hmm. It's how it affects the individuals in between and That's making right. sure that, that it's beneficial for them or respectful of their rights. As right. Well. So I'm always fascinated. You know, I've been working in politics for over 20 years now, and people come to the legislature for various reasons. But I'm always curious to know, you know, what influenced you growing up right. or even as an, an adult that made you want to serve? Right. Whether it be as county judge or state representative. Right. Well, I would certainly have to say the number one uh, influence in my life would be my father. Uh, he passed away when I was eight years old, and you know we had a family of seven. Uh, the oldest was 14, uh, the youngest was four, and oh, my, wow. my mother never remarried. So the legend that is my father within our family is quite impactful to myself and, and my children and, and the rest of my siblings. But my father believed strongly that every citizen has a duty to participate in mm -hmm. their government. And that can come in many different forms and shapes and sizes. It's not necessarily that you run for office, but that you participate, you vote. Right. I've always voted since I turned 18 in every election. I was in college Republicans. I was in young adult Republicans. You know, I volunteered on countless campaigns throughout my young adult age and, and as it moved forward in probably five or six or more different states uh, uh, throughout different uh, uh, election cycles. I was a state delegate to the Republican Party uh, okay. there. I was an election chair. You know, all those things like that, election judge, are important to, uh, to me as a result of some of the, uh, uh, I guess, direction my father gave. He did run for elected office back in the uh, 60s uh, and 70s. He was a Reagan Republican. He was a Reagan County Chairman, M Reagan M Montgomery County Chairman for Ra Ronald Reagan back in uh, 1980 and so he was a uh, conservative before his time he ran as a Republican <laughs> and and those were difficult times for Republicans sure, you know? sure. So he did not win office but he I respect that generation so much in shaping the value system of our state right. and 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 reframing that conversation you know that it's okay and and, and good to be a Republican and mm -hmm. and that we stand for great values right absolutely so you're now down here as a freshman legislator, and we are not quite halfway through the legislative session, but we're getting close. So tell me what your first impressions are of the building, the process, and the people. Yeah. Probably the most impressive aspect of being here uh, for the first time is the quality of individuals that I'm serving with. Mm. I truly believe one of the most beautiful aspects of our structure of government here in the legislature is that we are citizen legislators right and it is very taxing on your your ability to make an income because contrary to what most people believe we don't make we make seventy two hundred dollars a year we I was about to say remind, remind everybody say that again what's that right. breakdown to per month <laughs> well I'm not even sure like I, I don't even like to look a month at it. Right. usually right. What, I'm, right. what I've heard but right so you know we, you don't do this for the money right you do it with a servant's heart you know and and nobody's perfect of course uh, mm -hmm. but by and large, as a system of government, it ensures that people serving are doing it for the right reasons. And as I've gotten to know all of my colleagues, I've been very impressed with the quality of individuals that I'm serving with and working with and their sincere desire to try to improve the state of Texas. We right. may disagree on a lot of things, of course, yeah. but they're very sincere in their approach to try to improve Texas. And that's all you can ask for. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with that more. You know, we're in an interesting time because you have a new speaker in Dennis Bonin in right. the Texas House, and there hasn't been a new speaker for a decade. And in the past, as our audience knows from listening to other shows, there's been a lot of tension 
to use a, a soft word, between the House and the Senate and, and leadership there. How do you feel those relationships are now between the House and the Senate? You know, obviously I was not a, a part of it before, so I don't have any firsthand uh, knowledge of the interactions between the two. However, I certainly am seeing a wonderful working environment, mm -hmm. a very functional working environment where uh, people are sit willing to sit down and have the dialogue and discuss differences of opinions coming to the table to try to reconcile those differences and understand each other's perspective. Right. To, to look in somebody in the eyes and realize that there's a human being behind those two eyes that, that cares about something from their sure. district and they're trying to further that cause or, or stand up for that, that, that issue uh, that's important to their district. That is uh, a piece of the conversation that is missed at the federal level no so doubt. often. You right. know, it's, it's, Texas does not function like that. Uh, our government is, is much more functional and willing to discuss between urban and rural or Republican and Democrat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has been, uh, and Senate and House, you know, as well, and, and, and the governor and lieutenant governor and, and right. the speaker. It is a new day in the Texas House and in the Texas Senate and, and in Texas government. Right. And, I think it's healthy. I'm very proud to be a part of it and, and work in that context and work to help facilitate that type of environment in my discussions that I have. So it, it's, it's, I feel that's, as, as again, as much as you can ask. Sure. You know. Absolutely. You, you can't expect to accomplish great things if you can't have civil conversation. Absolutely. Right? That's right. So you're, you're here. What are you most passionate about? What are you, what are you working on this session? You know, the biggest issue by far for my district uh, is property tax relief, mm. you know, property tax reform, school finance reform. And so when the governor, lieutenant governor, and the speaker had their press conference and announced all three of them that that's their, those are their you know, highest priority items, that sits well with my district. You right. Know? And, and that, you know, House Bill 2, Senate Bill 2, that starts the conversation mm -hmm. moving forward on what that would look like. However, there's lots of ideas and you know things are going as the discussion happens things will change it's complicated Most, right it's a very big conversation it's right. complicated right lots of moving pieces lots of tentacles that are affected uh from that discussion as mm -hmm. you come up with solutions so i look for that it to evolve as time moves forward right uh but hoping that the end product takes into account and i believe it will uh takes into account rural situation, suburban, urban, the scope of all the considerations that need to be taken into account for the end product. So I think my, my, my district in particular is, is very tuned in to that discussion, Right. Uh, very hopeful that uh, we can come up with some meaningful improvements. Let me ask you this, when you're back home and you're talking to your constituents, is there a feeling out there that, hey, we understand that there are other issues that we care about, that we're passionate about, but look, you have finally, as a legislature, you have finally got to do something about property taxes and how we finance schools. I mean, is that the main focus right now? Yeah, I certainly would say that. In this last election cycle, I would, you know, knocked on thousands of doors, you mm -hmm. know, and the number one issue was that, and the, the, the feeling in, in my district and from door to door is that we are taxing people out of their homes. Right. Too much of our, and I, as a county judge, I've been uh, involved in this conversation for quite some time now. Sure. And I'm, I'm very familiar with it. You know, we, we cut property taxes in Grimes County two out of the three years that I was county judge. Right. Actually reduced the tax levy. Wow. Two out of the three years. So, it, you know, that's... that's and why, why was that? Is that because appraised values were going up, so you still had plenty of money coming into the coffers, which allowed you to lower the rate? No, what no. What happened is, so your tax levy, you're talking about the tax rate. Right. The tax levy is what I'm talking about. So, okay, so educate us on the tax levy, because I right. suspect most people don't understand the difference. Right. So when the landowners get their bill, when you multiply the tax, the appraised value times the tax rate, mm -hmm. you get the tax levy. That's the dollar that the land, the uh, citizen is going to pay to the to the government. Right. So when they see that dollar amount go up, that's a tax increase. Sure. When that dollar amount goes down, that's a tax decrease. Right. So your rate can go up or down 
Mm -hmm. Either way, depending on the appraised value, and still end up with a tax increase. Sure. Right? And so what we did was cut the budget and make sure that uh, when the oil and gas sector took a downturn, we didn't raise the tax rate to offset it. We kept the tax rate the same times a lower appraised value. Okay. And that extends out to a tax levy decrease, but in order to meet that decrease, I had to cut the budget. So mm. we did that two out of the three years that I was county judge, and, and I did that because I felt the feedback was that we are overtaxed as a society. You know, a lot of the, the unfunded mandates that came down from the state government end up getting funded by your local governments, your schools, sure. your counties, your cities. And the primary funding mechanism for those local governments is your property tax. Right. right. So when there's a disconnect between the, the law that gets passed that requires spending and funding that's associated with it, meaning that the, the trailer's unhitched and the funding stays back, back mm. in the capital, you know, but the, the mandate comes down. Right. You know, I love that analogy. Right. That's great. Yeah. Well, everybody in my district understands that. You know, you, you have to, you, you have, the money has to come from somewhere. And so mm. the only place that the local government primarily is the, is the property tax. That, so that puts a tremendous amount of pressure you, uh, on the local governments to increase property taxes to fund things like e-file. You know, the things like that that actually are state mandated that cost a lot of money sure. to implement. So, you know, I think uh, uh, that, that 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 strategy in particular is something that needs to be addressed. You know, that, okay. that has to be addressed. Right. Cycle. Absolutely. So tell me what the most important bill is that you have filed thus far. Most important by far. The, the by far, hands down, the most important is the anti-spoofing bill that I have filed. <laughs> I'm very... Talk, talk to us I, about spoofing. You know, that's where, you know, you get the telemarketers that call your cell phone. And you look at your cell phone and it looks like a number that's one digit away from your house phone or your, your wife's cell phone. Uh, it looks like it's a local call. Okay. From, and it's really a telemarketer right, selling a product, sure. trying to uh, uh, make a connection there. And so you end up blocking that call, right. and they call, they pick up a different number that looks mm. like a local number. So mm. th what this do does is it, it ensures transparency that, the, that, uh, that you know who it is, uh, ne not necessarily through caller ID, but you know where they're coming from, right. and they're not able to misrepresent who it is that's calling sure. you. Uh, and, and you're able to effectively block that number. Right, right. If you choose. You it's know. crazy that we have to think about those but things, but I, we do. I'll tell, tell you this, I, out of all the bills I've filed, when I go back into the district and I talk about that bill, it is standing ovation, <laughs> clapping, screaming, yelling, that, everybody. That's your reelection bill. Tired of that. huh? That's it. I didn't, if I would have only pulled that in the, uh, in the who primary. Would, who would have yeah, thunk it? Right, right. That is too funny. So being a, being a freshman legislator, uh, is there any hazing that goes on? People play any practical jokes, and has that happened to you yet? You know, uh, yes, it goes on for sure. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been the subject too much yet, okay. but I keep getting threats. Ah. The, the <laughs> warning coming. has been warning. issued. Right, right, right. right. They right. just want to keep your, your heightened awareness, yes, right? So you're yes. watching your back yes. and nervous all the time, I suppose. Right. You just, yeah. you just wait for it to come. You know, it's all in good sport and, and you know, and fun. It's part of the the process, you know, you have to earn your wings. And, that's right. And that's part of Well, it. I know one of the traditions for anybody who watches uh, the House debates on the floor, one of the traditions is when a freshman legislator offers up their first bill on the floor, there's a little bit of hazing that goes on there uh, from the back mic by more senior legislators, and then all your colleagues from your, your class get around you to support you. So. Um, you think it'll be the spoofing bill? I mean, is there some strategy that might go on to figure out which one you get to the floor first, or is that out of your control? Uh, you know, there's there's an uh, old saying, keep it simple. You know, uh -huh. right, right. That, that I think the simpler the bill, <laughs> the cleaner the bill, right. <laughs> the harder it is to come up with uh, funny things to, to talk about or strange things to talk about during that process. So I'll look to uh, keep mine clean and simple. I think that's wise, very wise of you. Speaking of wisdom, we like to close out each of our episodes with some words of wisdom from our guests. Sometimes this is a song lyric, a quote from a famous person, a Bible verse, or if you just got something brilliant off the top of your head that you want to share, please do and share something with our audience if you don't mind. Sure, sure. You know, one of the, the 
Bible verses I always rely on, and it gives me hope, it gives me courage, it gives me faith, is John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it reminds me that I'm not perfect, and neither are you, and neither, neither is anybody else that we're talking to, That's you know, right. and we're all going to make mistakes, but forgiveness is important, not just from God to us, but from us to each other, that we recognize we are not flawless individuals and, and that we, we ourselves make, make mistakes. So uh, that is a very humbling Bible verse that I think we all would be better off remembering on a daily basis. Oh, well, those are words of wisdom. As, as the legislative session continues, it will become more stressful. Tensions will undoubtedly increase. Right. So a forgiveness needs to be on everyone's hearts and some understanding and some love. You right. bet, absolutely. Well, Representative Ben Lamont, I appreciate you coming on the Trey Blocker Show, and I hope to have you back again sometime soon. Thank you, Trey. I appreciate being here. appreciate the invitation. enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. And thank you all for listening to the Trey Blocker Show. You can find us at TreyBlockerShow.com, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. Thank you, and God bless. This has been the Trey Blocker Show. Please subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and visit TreyBlockerShow.com to donate so we can keep fighting to restore sanity to this great nation.